Good morning, plant breeders, plant scientists, people that are fired up about plant breeding. Hey, good morning. This is David Benson, CEO and founder of Cornhusker Hybrids LLC in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, a global plant breeding and maize product development company. Today, we're going to further our mantra, success starts with the seed, which is the number one statement in all plant breeding. I'd like to say genetically enhanced seed. We're going to talk about continuous variation as play number four in a playbook. Now continuous variation would differ from what we will we'll define it as metric and not Mendelian in that Mendelian is more of simple traits or readily observable phenotypic changes of one or a few genes where a metric character could have many genes, including all of them in the genotype, and the whole entire genotype could be segregating for that trait. So it's going to be a continuous variation, more or less, you know, explained by the standard normal distribution linear type model that we are able to, from this, measure uh, some things that are pretty important, like population means and genetic variances and covariances and other variances as they, as they pertain to phenotypic variants. So continuous variation then, it was, it, I always use this example because it's like the easiest to wrap your hands around. And that is facial features in humans, okay? I, I'm not sure how many billion people there are on the earth right at this moment, it's a big number, but the, only way any two of them look the same exactly is if they're identical twins and you can go into how that happens we're not going to deal with that so every person every other person in the world however many billion they are they all look different in the facial features now if that was governed by a magic facial feature gene or a couple genes like one for short hair or long hair one for square head or round head, one for pointed nose to not pointed nose. It'd be easy, you could pick, you could point those genotypes out and you could predict them, right? Just like Mendel did with his P experiments. They were easy to see, he was able to predict them and show there was segregation and he's the father of genetics because of it. Well, facial features in humans, they're very different, even within your own family. You can see in your own family, if you look and you study, over time, the degree of resemblance in your relatives over time. But like every generation, they get infused with another 50%, right? Every time the daughter's married, they bring in new genetics. Every time the, the, the grandson's married, you bring in new genetics. So that genetically is constantly being modified, but you can still track that degree of resemblance between those relatives. And everyone sits around, well, does Johnny look more like Sue or more like Dave? So fe facial features in human are the ultimate one to think about and honestly there literally has to be like how many genes segregating for all these humans to look different literally thousands right i mean maybe hundreds of thousands if there's that many genes and i was quoted back in the day uh, i have a phd from iowa state that says behind it plant breeding and cytogenetics which means that i survived dr peter peterson's cytogenetics course which was very demanding um and, uh, you know, that's kind of how things go. So the genetics is huge and it's the biggest factor. Now we're talking about, let's get back to facial features. And then I want to extrapolate this into ear size or grain yield and maize. Maize is my particular chosen crop that I've worked with my whole entire life. Maybe it's the easiest crop to work with. Maybe it's not, but um, there's a continuum, there's continuums in traits in maize or other crops, plants or animals, continuous variation for a number of things. If you were just looking at say cob color in maize, it's probably red, white, or pink. Probably pretty simply inherited. I think red by red is red, white by white is white, and yellow by, or excuse me, white by red is pink. I think that's the way it is. If you're looking at kernel colors, there is a, con a quite a fairly actual big continuum of actual kernel colors. Green, bronze, blue, red, 
in quite a number, but cultivated maize is really down to two. It's like yellow or white, or you can, you can call it an offspring of yellow orange, but they're very easy to see and they're not complicated in their inheritance. Well, let's talk about yield in maize. You know, we talk about what we work with here in Nebraska, which is dry corn over scale that is for the least cost per bushel you can do it. I mean, net income per acre, and it's normally, it's got to start with great yields and then good management. Um, so my son, Benjamin, owns a, a seed company called Big Cop Hybrids. He operates out of Seward, Nebraska. It's the only independent family owned seed company in Nebraska. Um, and part of our, our sales area was got really big on the word Airflex. The questions I would get most often was whether our hybrids ears flex or they don't. And I'm like, you know, I breed a corn for bred corn for like a long time, 11 years in a commercial setting. And I pretty much took the hybrids at the top of the page and advanced them. I did not think a lot about if the ears flexed or not, or really what that ear phenotype was. And then I got to thinking, you know, all these people are coming to us and they're saying ear flex is important. Um, maybe I need to change my uh, ideas. So I started to, but I, I, to start with, we got to do some kind of a definition of what ear flex is. Now, of course, on maize, you have a primary ear primodia that puts the kernels on a cob, if you're not familiar with the crop. But so the ear flex would be the size, relative size of one ear on a hybrid compared to a different hybrid with say a different ear type. And what we talk about ear flex is the ability or the change in ear length or ear girth, which is diameter or both length and girth in a corn hybrid in response to the seasonal environmental variation or fluctuations. Now, what's the biggest one? Anywhere in the world you go, it's drought or it's, it's periods of when you don't get enough moisture, too much heat. How does your product survive during those times? So the thing was, we want these hybrids with these ears that'll flex if the conditions are good, but they won't flex as much downward if the conditions are not in what plant populations you plant those on, how much do those ears flex, and how, you know, does that translate into dollars? So I said that we were going to talk about things that nobody ever talks about. We're talking about ear flex. I've never heard anybody talk about it in any kind of a setting, but it's really important in our sales area. And a lot of people are pretty interested in it. They just really don't think that much about it. So I set up a study and I'll just show you the parameters here. And because of the way I sit here, I almost, I really have to cover my, almost my face for a minute for you just to see them and hopefully you can get them in a short glance. Um, I worked with 25 commercial maize hybrids for two years, plant populations from 16,000 to 40,000. We were in a, a full irrigation setup. In other words, they, never, they were never lacking for water. And uh, we measured, I went out into every plot at harvest time and I did my best, which no one can do, but I tried to do it the same by selecting 10 ears out of every population that were in a, in a spot. I grabbed the best 10 ears I could find. I never took seconds and I kept those ears and I used those. Those were what was used in the study. So the traits I took then later were ear length on every ear in every plot that I harvested, ear diameter, cob diameter, and then I took a hundred kernel weight and I weighed my 10 ears as kind of a crude yield measurement. That really wasn't, I really wasn't after the yield as much to start with as I wanted to see how the ears changed. And of course that relates to yield, yes, but in the literature, if you're in the U.S., you're going to read about essentially there's four ear types. There's what we call determinant which as we think about determinant, essentially they don't change much in response to the population. So if your population is not high enough, you're gonna reduce your yield and to get the most 
you know, you have to find that hot spot, high hot spot on the high end where it's maximized. And in Nebraska, some determinate hybrids, they get planted from 36 to 42,000 plants per acre, which would be over 100,000 per hectare. So that can happen. Then we have what we call semi-determinate, which is kind of a tweener between the semi-determinate, they'll change it somewhat in response to the limited flex and then full flex hybrids. So you have that continuum from, from determinate, semi-determinate, semi-flex, flex. And that continuum is a continuous continuum that you can measure. Now we had 25 hybrids, so we knew something about these hybrids. We knew what kind of ear types, essentially, we would put those four classes in before I did the experiment. So what I wanted to know was what happened at different populations between the different ear types and what was kind of the maximum spot to maximize ear flex on hybrids where you could do it, because all hybrids won't do it. Only a few will do it really well, and it was important in our sales area. So anyway, at the end of the day, you're gonna find out the things if you look at all of these hybrids together that you would expect. I mean, as you increase the plant population, at some point, you're gonna get less corn per ear, right? You're gonna have less weight per, Per, per ear, you're going to have less kernels of grain per plant or less weight per plant and, and less across that. So you start with a continuum and you can plant corn, you can plant it thick enough that it won't set an ear and you can keep thinning it out. You can get to where you have a plant every, you know, 10 feet and you might have five ears on it or eight ears on it. I've seen this crazy stuff at times. And you have to remember that's not what you want, of course, but an ear primordia gets laid at every node as the plant's developing. If it gets thin enough and the conditions are really good, it'll put on a lot of ears, right? But we want one ear in maize, one primary ear, we've proven that. And then we want it to be able to, we want it in our sales area, they say we want it to be able to flex, we want it to respond. And really what we're saying is we want to be able to plant less plants per acre and get the same kind of a yield and hedge our environment. But we don't know what it is the next year. We have no idea what the environment's gonna be next year. I can't tell you for sure what, whether we're gonna get rain or not in August here. July's been dry, June's been dry, last fall was dry. Right now the corn looks good, but I don't know what's gonna happen next month. But that's when those ears are gonna be filling and those kernels are gonna be deciding how big they're gonna get. Well, so we found out the things you would, you would expect. Ear diameter, well, decrease, you know, as you get bigger and higher and higher plant populations in generally speaking, but not always. And the thing is, there's outliers in here. Some hybrids that we know we have of particular genetics that absolutely you have to just, you want yield, you got to put the plants out there. That's it. Other hybrids, we can plant 75%, 65% of the, of the uh, plant population, save the guy some money on seed and get the same yield and hedge his bed against, against the environment. And that's the kind of hybrids that our guys want. That's the kind of hybrids we're, we're getting to them. And those are the kind of hybrids we sell the most of. And when you talk about ear flex, you say, well, you know, they don't flex very much. Well, yeah, they can. They can flex quite a bit as my study shows, whether you're growing at 16,000 plants or 40. But the whole thing is, is how does it translate then back? Because the ears change, they change in length, they change in girth, they change in both. Some hybrids, the ear just gets longer, like 0868 we have. Other hybrids, like B1337, the hybrid will just get bigger and bigger. I, we physically have it listed in our book from 18 to 26 kernel rows. And people go, well, you can't have a hybrid 18 to 26 kernel rows. Well, I can show you that in fact that hybrid can do it and it's a very rare hybrid. It should have been really used a lot more than it's been, but it, it just never was, never quite made everybody's favorite hybrid list. But in our, in our uh, area that we sell into in Nebraska and Kansas, it is a tremendous hybrid for hedging your bet in the weather and plant population. And these hybrids, I've heard people say from other companies, wow, there's no hybrid that will do 10 
bushels per thousand. In the heck there's not. There's hybrids that'll do 15 bushel per thousand. I've seen them do it. And those are the ones you want. And a lot of people are looking for a little less seed. And that's a way to save money. But our guys want Airflex. And the reason you want Airflex is so you can hedge your bet something against the environment that you can't predict ahead of time. And you want to have that ability for that ear to flex to the season. And that's something that's really important for our guys. And it became so important to me that I actually started a breeding program up, changed my breeding program. It's a small breeding program. But I changed it because I'm, I'm shooting for that now because I've got, we analyzed all this data and I can know what kind of ears I'm looking for, what kind of regression I'm, coefficients I'm looking for on the population and that sort of thing. So it's pretty exciting to see where it goes. So I'll just close with that today to think about continuous variation in, in your program, wherever it is now, and you're going to measure that. that. That's a quantitative genetics. You know, that's what quantitative genetics is about, is characterizing populations, measuring certain traits, making predictions, and selecting the best ones and advancing it, and being able to predict somewhat in the future how things are going to go. That's still what people are doing in quantitative genetics today, whether they're using AI, robotics, uh, drones, flying over fields to help do it. They're still doing it. That's what we're doing. So i just like to close today by saying that next week, as I promised when I started this channel, we're going to talk about something that I've never heard anybody talk about. And that is, in my mind, the number one corn, pop, corn hybrid that the world's ever seen, possibly in the stratosphere. And it's an old hybrid, but it's B73 by Mo17. And that hybrid and inbreds developed from those, inbreds developed from those two inbreds practically dominate the inbreds that are used in the world today. They're all progeny of B73 types or Mo17 types or that hybrid type. And there's some really unique things about that hybrid a lot of people don't talk about. So next week, tune in, we're gonna talk about it. Thank you all for tuning in. Again, please go to my YouTube channel Commercial Plant Breeding 101 and subscribe if you like it. Thank you.